thank God for another opportunity to come in his presence. Amen. Have a, have a wonderful, good word for you all this morning. Amen. Praise God. I hope that someone has passed out the handouts. Yes. Everyone has one. Everyone has one. Except me. <laughs> Mine's up here. Praise the Lord. I, we thank God for each of you. We pray that you're blessed in the service of, and that God would speak to our hearts through the message this morning. We thank God for those who are watching by Facebook and YouTube. We pray that God will continue to bless you all as well. Thank God for my sister who always joins us every Sunday, Sister Wendy Smith King. God bless you. And we pray that God will keep you. Brother Jesse Cox from Memphis, Tennessee. They always join us every Sunday morning. We give God the glory for them. Amen. Amen. There's a word from the Lord, and we're going to. Swap seat. There you go. The message this morning. It is titled, The Image of the Beast and the Root of All Evil. The Image of the Beast and the Root of All Evil. Before I go into the message for this morning, I want to share some very important information that all of us as believers need to know and understand. And that is, we are living in the last days. We are living in the last days. And it's truly evident that we are living in the last days when we look around and see how the world is. How deception is plaguing the world like never before. People are believing everything but the truth. Come on, amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus said the truth will make you free. One of the things that I no gives us evidence that we're living in the last days. It is taken from Matthew chapter 24. The disciples asked Jesus this question. What shall be the signs of your coming and the end of the world? Question that many of us should be asking today. Lord, what is the sign of your coming and the end of this wicked world? Jesus answered his disciples and said, Take heed, be careful that no man will deceive you. For many shall come in my name and deceive many. When he said come in my name, he said that many will come representing his power, his authority. And they're going to deceive many. Then he went on to say in verse 11 of Matthew 24, and many false prophets shall arise. A prophet is a messenger of God. Many messengers of God will arise, but they are going to be false. They're going to be deceptive teachers. They're going to say the Lord say when the Lord did not say. Many false prophets shall arise. Not a few, many. And they're going to deceive many. And because of the false prophets, in verse 12 he said, and iniquity shall what? Abound. In other words, iniquity is going to spread all over the land. What is iniquity? False information that deceives people. Lies rather than the truth. That's what iniquity is. False information. And people believe the lies that they're hearing. Iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. Listen at that. People are going to fall away from loving God. I also remember reading where Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, praise God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said these words, Except there come a falling away first. 
falling away. People are going to fall away from the truth. Don't want to hear it. Except that come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of what? Perdition. The man of sin is going to be revealed. Most false messengers of God, they tell us that the man of sin is some super powerful human being that is going to come and rule the whole world. Imagine that. One man being raised up, he's going to rule China, Australia, Korea, America, France. He's going to rule all these countries. Can you believe that? Doesn't make any sense, do it? One man? No. When the Bible says the man of sin be revealed, it's talking about the devil. The devil is the man of sin to be revealed, and he has already been revealed. He's, the Re Revelation 12 and 9 say, when he was fell from heaven, he deceived the whole world. That's his objective, to deceive the whole world. The man of sin is the devil, Satan. The reason why we know this because the scripture goes on to say he sits himself up in the temple of God, making the people believe that he's God. Can a human being do that? Set himself up in the temple of God. We, the scripture in the new covenant is not talking about a man-made temple. The temple of God is Jesus Christ. And your body is the temple of God. In other words, Satan wants to set himself up where? In you. He wants to control your mind, your thoughts. Isn't that what Jesus wants to do? Control your mind, your thoughts? He said, be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. The devil wants to control your mind too. He wants to do exactly what Jesus wants to do. Jesus in the scripture is called the son of man. Jesus is called the son of man. This is what he called himself, right? We know him as the son of God, but he called himself the son of man. Therefore, Satan is the opposite. He's the man of sin. The son of perdition. That word perdition means that a, a person has fallen from grace and cannot return. Satan was the only one that fell from grace and cannot return. Because the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his what? son, that whosoever believeth in him shall be saved. See, everybody has a chance to be saved. Except the man of sin, the son of perdition. Satan himself. Amen? Amen. My point is, this is a wicked world we're living in, and it's controlled by lies and deception everywhere. Let us go into the message. In this message, the image of the beast and the root of all evil. In this message, we're going to learn who exactly the Pharisees and the scribes were. Who were exactly these people who was in opposition against Christ? What caused them to have all this power in Jerusalem over the temple worship and over the people? How did they accomplish having all this power? The answer is in our lesson this morning. The image of the beast and the root of all evil. What is an image? An image is something physical, something tangible that can be touched, right? Something physical. Exodus chapter 20, I think it was verse 4. In it, we find what we call the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, God said, in the second commandment, thou shalt not worship what? Any graven image. Anything that is made by man, you shall not worship it. You should not worship any graven image. In other words, graven something made 
by the human being. You can't wash them. Amen? Amen. So that lets us know that an image is something physical that we can see. Amen? Amen. Praise God. But what is a beast? A beast. We all know what a beast is, right? If we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, and God made all the what? The beast of the earth, the animals of the earth. God made all the animals of the earth. We know that our King James Version doesn't use the word animal, right? So the scripture uses the word beast to describe all animals, no matter what type they be. Cat, dogs, lions, tigers, bears, they all are called beasts in the scripture. But in the scripture as well, we all know that everything has a natural perspective, and then there's a what? Spiritual. Let me read um, information that we have here, taken from uh, 2 Corinthians. The Bible can be read from a natural perspective, right? But it cannot be understood in the natural. Keep that in mind. You can read the Bible in the natural, but you cannot understand it in the natural. Why? Because it's a spiritual book. The information in it is spiritual. You got to be born again in order to understand it. You got to be spiritual in order to understand it. For God has revealed the mystery of his word to us how? By his spirit. So his spirit has to be where? In you. You can read the book, right? The natural words, but the spiritual meaning of it has to be revealed to you by God. Amen? Amen. For man knoweth the things of a man, right? And that's what man know? The things of a man. Praise God. But the things of God no man knows. Except God revealed them to him. Right? And all the time, this is why so many people who say they're Christians, they have no clue of what the word is saying. No understanding of the word. Many people have been sitting in church all their life and still don't understand any of the word. Sad, they don't even understand who Jesus really is. Praise God. The things of God are revealed to us by his spirit. Amen? Amen? So when you look at the word beast, it means animal in the natural. Right? Yeah. But there's a spiritual application, there's a spiritual understanding of the word animal. Word beast. There's a spiritual. And it's recorded in Daniel chapter 7. Verse 3 to 7. Daniel described four great beasts coming from the sea. Are y'all listening? Mm -hmm. Daniel described four great beasts coming from the sea. Very similar to the message that Christ gave to John in Revelation 13. John saw one great beast coming from the sea. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, the scripture plains to tell us, John, the waters which you saw are people, nations, and tongues. So what John saw coming from the sea? The sea represents the people, the nations, and the tongues. He saw a great beast coming from the sea. And when you look at Daniel 7, 23, the beast which thy saw are kingdoms. So what, what Daniel saw is four great kingdoms coming from the sea. Are y'all hearing me? What John saw in Revelation 13 and 1, he saw one great kingdom coming from among the people. 
Daniel described these beasts, these animals, as a kingdom. And he also said the first beast, remember he saw four, the first beast was like a lion, the second was like a bear, the third was like a leopard. Then the fourth beast that Daniel said he saw, he couldn't describe it. He said this one looked terrible and vicious. Why? Because they had seven heads. That's not natural to see an animal with seven heads, is it? So, but this is what Daniel saw. And this is what John saw in Revelation 13 and 1. And when we look at Revelation 13 and 1, the scripture is clear. John saw a what? Kingdom. Beast represents kingdoms. Even today, don't we use animals to represent our kingdoms? Don't we see that? America, the bald eagle, right? England, they use an animal to represent their kingdom. The lion. Russia used a lot, uh, the bear to represent their kingdom. Did y'all know this stuff? All these kingdoms, they use animals even today. The Bible uses animals to describe kingdoms, and people are still doing it today. South Korea uses the tiger as to represent their kingdom. And I can go on and on of different nations and kingdoms that uses animals. We even use animals to represent our schools and stuff, don't we? <laughs> Come on. Okay. So it's not unusual to see this in the Bible. People are doing the same thing today. But here in Revelation 13 and 1, John sees a kingdom coming from among the sea, which is the people. He sees a kingdom coming from the people. He said the kingdom was like a what? A lion. <laughs> Amen. A bear. And a leopard. He described the same animals that Daniel saw. And there's something very interesting here. If you look up Proverbs, it's not in our handout, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 15. Look at that text. I'm going to keep going. If somebody pull it up, Sister Robinson, pull it up, and we're going to read that text. Remember, John C., a kingdom with seven heads and what? Ten horns, but the kingdom had the resemblance of a lion, a leopard, and a bear. But here's the interesting thing to understand about the kingdom. He said, and the dragon was the seat of power. The dragon was the seat of power of the kingdom. Who's the dragon? Somebody tell us. Who's the dragon? The devil. Satan himself. Praise the Lord. Satan is the dragon. He is the king of this kingdom. The Bible does tell us that Satan is the god of what? This world. Am I right? He's the god of this world. He's the prince and the powers of the air. Right? Remember reading Ephesians 2 and 1 last week where he said, And you has he what? Quickened who were once dead in your trespasses and sins, who once walked according to the what? Course of this world. Amen? Amen. We used to be of the world. We used to have that same spirit. Somebody say spirit. spirit. That worketh in the what? Children of disobedience. There's a spirit working in the world. There's a spirit controlling the world. You better understand this. That's why the Bible says, we are, we're not up against flesh and blood. Spiritual wickedness. Where? In high places. That's what you're up against in this world. So you better be spiritually strong. In the Lord and in the power of his might. There's a spirit working in the children of disobedience. The prince and the powers of the air. That's Satan controlling the airwaves. So all this information that, that you see coming through the airwaves. Amen. Is of the devil. So we better not hear any of it. Don't take it in. If we move on, 
I hope it's clear to you that there's a kingdom of this world that is wicked. It's not a physical kingdom that you can see. You remember, we talked about Jesus coming to what? Establish what? What kind of kingdom? A spiritual kingdom. A kingdom that cannot be seen with the eyes. I want y'all to listen to me carefully. That's the kind of kingdom that we are a part of. That's the kind of kingdom we live in. That's why the Bible says we're not of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Why? Because we're citizens of his spiritual kingdom. Amen. That's why the Bible says we now live in heavenly places, even though we're on earth. Come on. Amen. We're in heavenly places. We are living in a spiritual kingdom. As I said earlier, whatever Jesus does, the devil wants to duplicate and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. See, there was a time when God had a physical kingdom called Israel and Jerusalem, but the Bible speaks of a what? New Jerusalem. Somebody said New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. That came down from heaven. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? Praise God. And, and the Bible described that New Jerusalem as the church. It's found in Revelation 12. I'm not sure of the verse. So the devil wants to do the same thing. Now he has himself a what? Spiritual kingdom. <clears throat> Anytime you're dealing with something spiritual, the only way you can see and understand the spiritual is with the mind. But most of us are conformed to the world and we go by what we see. Yeah. <laughs> with the eyes. Am I right? We go about what we see with the natural eyes. That's why when we look at number 10 on page 2 in our handout, not, uh, um, oh, that's not the verse. Actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, same chapter there, but at, in verse 18, it says, we look not on the what? Things that are what? Natural we don't look on the things. When you become a believer in Christ, you don't look on the things that are natural. Why? Because the things that are natural are what? Temporary. But we look on the things that are what? Spiritual. We see with the mind. Amen? Because the things that are spiritual are what? Eternal. Praise the Lord. I want you to look at Page two in your hand out. The beast, the kingdom of darkness. The beast, the kingdom of darkness. I think in Revelation chapter 16, verse 10, the scripture plainly tells us that the, that the kingdom of this world is full. Somebody said full. Full. Of full. darkness. Yes. That's why Jesus said when he came, he said, I came to bring light. Oh, glory, into the world. And if any man believes in me, he shall not walk in the darkness of the world, but he shall have the what? Light of life. In other words, believers ought to be able to see where they're going in this world, this dark, evil world. I want y'all to understand something here, that the beast is the kingdom of the devil. When you read Revelation 13, don't believe nothing else. It's the kingdom of the devil. And the Bible is clear in Revelation 14 and 15 that the beast makes an image for everyone to worship. Listen to me carefully. The beast makes an image for everyone to worship. Are y'all hearing me? And that image... In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, rather, verse 10 is described as the love of money. There's one power that rules this world that Satan is using to, to control everything and everyone. There's one power he's using. You don't believe me? Tomorrow is Monday morning. Let's go out in any city around here, in Atlanta, Chicago, everybody's moving about, and most of it is all about going to make what? Money. Money. Sure. 
Why? Because money is the power that the devil is using to control the minds of the people in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. The Bible says he makes an image for everyone to worship or be killed. <laughs> in other words, the devil wants you so obsessed with making money until you have it in your mind and your heart. I can't live without it. The image of the beast is your money. This is it. Amen? Amen. Money is the image of the beast. This is the image that controls everything in the world. I can go into a lot of detail though tell you how, but we want to keep moving because I want to get to the heart of my message. There's a connection there. The beast, the kingdom of this world, this dark, evil, wicked world, the image of the beast and the what? Root of all evil. There's a great connection there. So the image of the kingdom of Satan that is worshipped in this world, the Bible calls it the root of all evil. Let's go to <clears throat> page three in your hand now. Turn with me. We're going to get deep into some scripture. Page three in your hand now. How many believe money is the most powerful image in the world? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things in the world. We have we have, we have gold and silver, and we have we have all kinds of uh, tangible images in the world, don't we? Mm -hmm. But how many of us see gold anymore? We don't see it, do we? How many of us have silver in our homes? <laughs> Pearls and diamonds. That's the real wealth of the world. But I'm here to tell you, the most powerful image of the world is your euro and your American dollar. Mm -hmm. These are the two sources of money made by men, right? And the objective of men is to use it to control the whole world. Listen to me carefully. Let's read some scripture. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 on page 3 in your handout. Paul is speaking to Timothy. Paul had already told Timothy that I'm going to be leaving. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Paul knew that. But he left Timothy in charge. And all the churches that they had been going all over the world establishing, he told Timothy, I want you to go back to these churches and I want you to give them the message that I give you. Are you listening? And here's one of the messages that Paul wanted Timothy to give to the churches. And it's for the church. Somebody say the church. The the church. church. Today. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 6 verse 6. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Listen, listen, listen. This is a word for the people of God. Mm -hmm. Godliness and being satisfied with being godly is great gain. In other words, when you have the knowledge of Jesus Christ in your heart, you have the greatest thing in the world. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Nothing can compare to the wisdom of God in your heart. Don't you forget that. Amen. So being satisfied with godliness, with the wisdom of God in your heart, 
you have gained everything you need. Because the Bible goes on to say, we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we are not going to carry anything out. God in his contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Read verse 8. And having food and raiment. And having food and clothing and shelter. Let us be therewith content. Be satisfied. You got everything you need. Amen. But look at Christians today. I mean, this is written to the believers now. He's not talking to the world. He's telling the Christian, you be satisfied with having some food in your, on your table, mm -hmm. some clothes on your back, mm -hmm. a house to live in. Mm -hmm. But man, we ain't satisfied. Mm -hmm. Read. For they that will be rich. For they that want more than what they need. See, being rich is desiring more than what you need. But they that will be what? Rich. What happens? Fall into temptation and a snare. Fall where? Into temptation. In other words, they're tempted to live in sin. And they're going to fall in a trap. Continue to read. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Listen at this. I think this is self-explanatory. Self You're going to fall into a lot of foolish and hurtful lusts. Don't you know people with a lot of money have the power to buy a lot of foolish things? Drugs, alcohol, liquor, sex, you have access to everything. Hmm? If you're a poor drug addict, you can't get to it, but my goodness, if you're rich. Come on. She said you can get all the drugs you want. And that's exactly what a lot of them are doing. You're going to fall into a lot of foolish and hurtful lust. Read. Which drown men in destruction. Does what? It drowns you in what? Destruction. destruction. Come on, read some more. And perdition. And in perdition. We, we, we talked about that word earlier, perdition. Perdition means you, you're separated from God and you're never going to be able to return to him. Man, I don't want to fall into perdition. You know, people can get so caught up into themselves until they're separated from God and they can't even see their way back to it. That's perdition. You done fell so deep. The Bible in Revelations calls it the bottomless pit. <laughs> Imagine falling into a bottomless pit. That bottomless pit is you're falling to an into lies and deception, and, and, it, and it has drowned you. And you can't get out, she says. There's no way out. Drown in petition. Read some more. Come on. For the love of money. This is the text I want you to understand. For the what? Love of money. The love of what? Money. The image that controls the world. When you love it, what happens? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We're going to dwell on this verse. For the love of money is the root of all evil. For which some did what? Covenant after. And it caused them to do what? Turn from the faith. This message is to the people of God, not the world. Because the people of God are the only ones that are in the faith. Come on. And the devil wants you to turn from it. And it is the power of money that has caused people to turn from the faith. For the love, somebody said love, love. of money is what? The root of all evil. Can somebody tell me that, uh, the difference between love and worship? Is, is, uh, is there a difference? Hmm? There is no difference. Love is giving of what? Self to someone else. In this case, when you worship the image of the beast, the, the, you worship money, you're giving yourself to, you're serving it rather, rather than using it. See, there's nothing wrong with having money, but you got to use it as a resource, not allow it to be the source. Because the source is who? God. 
Love and worship is the exact same thing. So when a person falls in love with money, he is worshiping money. In other words, according to Revelation 13, 14, and 15, he's worshiping the image that the kingdom of Satan has set up for everyone to worship. Can anybody name anything else that controls the world like money? If you can come up with something else, then I'll change my message. I might as well go sit down. <laughs> then people got the nerve to say, the mark of the beast is a computer chip. Yeah. That's foolishness. The devil don't need to make no chip to put under your skin when he got you in love with money already. <laughs> what do you need a chip for? The chip is just a smoke screen, something to distract you from what the mark really is. The mark represents his power and authority over you when you love money. You see, this thing is worship is always, because somebody say always, always. voluntarily. Okay. See, they got you thinking that the devil's going to go around killing people if they don't worship the image. They got people thinking, no, the scripture says he makes an image for the people who want to worship. And then not only that, he said, and all the world wondered after the image of the beast. What you mean by what you think he meant by that? They were amazed. They were in love with him. They were mesmerized <laughs> by it. Have you noticed on TV <laughs> they love showing you stacks of it? <laughs> Am I right, sister? They love show you. Now, every movie is going to have to show you stacks and stacks of money. They want you to see it. Robbing the banks. Amen. You got some big in front of women pulling out a big hand. I told this man one day, I said, you stop pulling out that man. Love. Love. <laughs> Loving money is no different than worshiping money. This is Satan's way of turning you from the worship of God. In Luke chapter 4, the, the devil saw Jesus on this high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Not only that, but the devil said, I'm going to show you all of its glory. So we can we poor folk can see that see the kingdom, but if it's his glory, we can't be a part of that until we worship him. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. What is it? What is the glory of the world? They let you see it on your television screen. That's all the glory of the world. All the people you see on your television screen. I learned something the other day. <laughs> Very interesting. I learned something the other day that was very interesting. All your actors in Hollywood, over 90% of them, never went to a public school like this young man does, like we did. Did y'all know that? The Denzel Washington, the Oprah Winfrey's, the, the, uh, uh, the Beyonce's, and the Tupac's, and, the, and, all, and, the, and, the, and the list can go on. These people never went to a public school. Did y'all know that? No. Not <laughs> Their parents were very rich people. And here you got Tupac and, and Ice Cube, and acting like they were, they come up as gangsters. <laughs> and they come up in a fine arts school. Never saw a public school in a day out of their lives. Hmm. They were molded and trained to be in the place where they are. Are y'all hearing me? Most of their parents had already been in the place where they are. If you go, and that's why when they always advertise the NFL and all this stuff, and, I mean, <laughs> glory, glory to God. They say very few people come out of college and make it into the NFL. Only a few from your public schools do. Mm -hmm. Did y'all know most of the, 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 the best players in the, in the NFL, their parents were in the NFL? And their <sighs> parents were, were either in a, uh, they were they were up in, in the top of that pyramid system somewhere. Actors and 
and uh, bankers and all these big time folk. It is their children that are guaranteed a spot in there. Did y'all notice that? Let's get on to the message. Worshiping money and loving money is the same thing. Satan wants you to turn from the worship of God to the worship of money. I want you to notice something Paul said that causes people to turn. Read that verse again. Verse number 10. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Read it again. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. Stop right there. What caused people to fall in love with money is covetousness. Covetousness is desiring more than what you need so that you can glorify yourself, your flesh. That's what covetousness is. Another word for it is greed. When you want more than what you need, the Bible identifies you are a person of greed. Did y'all know that? Because my question is this. If you want more than what you need, what is your motive? Why do you want more than what you need? I want more than what I need so that I can help somebody else. Does y'all hear me? But what is the average person's reason for wanting more than what they need? Glorify their flesh. That's what covetousness is. And I want you to understand that when you look at that word covetousness, we're going to dwell on who were covetous in the days of Jesus when he was living on earth as a human being. I want you to understand that loving money is the same as worshiping money. You're worshiping the image of the beast. Turn to page four in your handout. I know we're skipping over some of this stuff, but I, I, you can take time to read it on your own time. But I do want you to understand and know that the opposite of loving God is loving money. Jesus said you cannot serve what? Two, Two masters. You got to love one, hate yeah. the other. Despise one, cleave to the other. Am I right? I want you to go deep back into the scripture. Even in the old covenant, the great commandment was to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and with all your might. This is the great commandment of God, right? Even in, even in Deuteronomy, back in Deuteronomy 6, it tells you what the great commandment was. Verse 6 and 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love who? The Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? Yeah. In your heart. Now that was way back in the Old Testament. Now he gave them ten commandments. He told them to obey this, but the, but the commandment of love, he said, I want it in your heart. Oh, you can listen now. <coughs> now, I want you to keep that word covetousness, greed, in the back of your mind. But I want you to turn to Mark chapter 28. Now, chapter 12, verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28 <coughs> to 33. In these particular verses, you're going to see something very powerful. Something very powerful. First, I'd like to say that when Jesus came to the earth, there were people who controlled the temple worship and they were against him. Those people were called the Pharisees and the scribes. 
Whenever they followed Jesus, they only wanted to listen to what he said so they can go back and tell, hey, <laughs> this man is teaching different than what we teach. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes were the teachers of the law. But how did they become teachers of the law? That's the good question. But before I answer that question, we're going to go to Mark chapter 12, verse 28. I want you to keep in mind, a scribe is a teacher of the word of God. That's what a scribe was in the Bible, a teacher of the word of God. We have teachers of the word of God today that we can call scribes because they mix what God say with what they want to say. And what they do is they take what God say and mix it and then put in what they want to say so that the people can be subject to them rather than God. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Why? Because you love keeping the commandments and the doctrines of who? Men. Those men were the Pharisees and the scribes that the people loved keeping their doctrine. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they came in the first century of the Roman Empire. There were no Pharisees and the scribes back in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. There were no Pharisees. They came to control the temple worship during the Roman Empire. The Pharisees and the scribes were lawyers. Somebody say lawyers. Lawyers. Don't we have them today? <laughs> Amen. Look at, look at, and they were the teachers of the law. The te see, the people highly, the, the people, the poor people highly respected the Pharisees and the scribes. You know why? Because they were rich. When Paul was speaking in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, he said, For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which some coveted after. See, he was really talking about how the Pharisees and the scribes were in their control of the temple worship and the people. Because if anybody knew <laughs> about the Pharisees and the scribes, Paul did because at one time he was a Pharisee. Right? He knew that they were the ones who were covetous. They were the ones who, who were greedy for money. You see, when the Roman Empire came into power, the Pharisees and the scribes they got connected to the Roman power because the Roman power used money to control the people like we do today. Are y'all listening? And the Pharisees and the scribes, they love being a part of that. They love being in connection with the Roman Empire because they got paid to keep the people under the rule and power of the Roman Empire. Don't we see people like that today? All right, let's look at this chapter here, Mark 12, verse 28. One of the scribes, which is a teacher of the law, came and asked Jesus a question. Now, whenever the scribes asked Jesus the question, they weren't asking so they can gain knowledge of, of who he was. There are people that will ask you a question just to see what you're going to say, to see what your answer is going to be. They are already going to, they already have made up their mind that they're going to disagree with you. Huh? Have you seen people like that? They got their minds already made up that they're going to disagree. This Pharisee, this scribe came and asked Jesus, which commandment is the greatest commandment in the law? A scribe asked Jesus that question. A teacher of the law asked Jesus that question. He, he asked that question because he wanted to see what Jesus was going to say. And I want you to listen carefully. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is what? Hear, O Israel. He quotes from Deuteronomy. You see that? Now, can you see it? The Lord our God is one God. Verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. And this is the first great commandment. 
When the scribe asked Jesus the question, what commandment is the great commandment? Jesus told him to love God with all your heart. Then he said in verse 31, and the second is like, is like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Why are we trying to keep the ten? There's no other commandment that is greater than these two. Love God with all your heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. But look what the scribe said, the teacher of the law said, verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. Wow. And to love him with all thy heart and with all thy understanding and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. This, this is the teacher of the law talking now. And to love thy neighbor as, as himself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So all this stuff we do in church, it can't compel the loving God and your neighbor. Are you hearing me? Look what it says. It's better than all the offerings and the sacrifices. See, all your church attendance and all the stuff, your tithing, all this stuff, it can't compare with keeping the great commandment of love. Right? Amen. And when Jesus saw that, he answered discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And nobody else asked him any questions after that. He told the man, being that you know what the great commandment is, you're very close now to being in the kingdom of God. Why do he say you're close to being in the kingdom? Because now you got to obey it. Now you know, but now you got to put it in action, right? You're close to the kingdom when you know. <laughs> Glory to God. The Pharisees and the scribes, they changed the temple worship in Jerusalem from the love of God to the love of money. That's what they did. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, the Bible says they were very rich. And even today, poor people highly respect people who are wealthy. Am I right? That's why they love putting the people that are wealthy on your television. Because they, they know you're going to idolize these people. Am I right? And back in that day, the same thing then. The Pharisees and the scribes had lots of money. And what they did, they went into the temple. And they got the priests and the Levites to change the worship of God to the worship of money in the temple. Then we see it happen when Jesus came in and turned over the tables. You see, that was a time when the tide was food, right? And cattle. In other words, the people worked their fields and they would bring a part of their crop and their cattle to the temple so that the, they give 10% of it so that the, the, uh, the Levites and the priesthood could have food to eat. But the scribes came in and they changed it, the tide, from food to money. That's what happened. They changed it. They changed the tide from food to money. So now the temple is all about what? Money. Money, money. Rather than worshiping God. This is what happened in the temple back in Jesus' day. This is why Jesus came into the temple and he, they were selling the doves. There was a time when the people would bring their doves and their animals from the fields and they would, sac they, they would sacrifice their animals before the priest. They would cut the throat of the animal and the blood was shed for the remission of sin. But now the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees say, hey, we don't, we don't want the people to bring their animals to the temple anymore. Let's sell them the animals in the temple. And when Jesus came in the temple, he saw that them doing this. He said, you have changed my father's house yeah. from the house of worship to a den of thieves. Oh, yeah. This is what Jesus said. And, and, we, and we can see it clearly today. Yeah. I remember when I come up in the church in the 70s and the 80s, people came to the altar to get saved. Now they come to the altar to get money. Amen. 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 
And the preachers are not concerned about the souls coming to the altar to, to give to God the soul. Bring your money to the altar now. This is what this all started among the Pharisees and the scribes. The tithe became what? Money. No longer it was food. It became money. But the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, for the love of money is the what? Root of all evil. And I'm going to tell you something here. When you love money, you're worshiping it. There's no difference in love and worship. Both require sacrifice of self. And the temple worship changed from the worship of God to the worship of money. And Jesus said, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. And now he, then he told him, he said, this house is left desolate. God is no longer here. This is why in the new covenant, your body is the temple of God. That's what God worships at now. That's what worship is at in your heart. The true worshiper worships where? In spirit. Amen. And in truth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's where the true worshiper worships now. No longer. It's a building. It's the place of worship. It's a place where we may all come to fellowship. But the building itself is not the house of God. Your body is the temple of the living God. Yes. Yes. People coming in now and, 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 they're, and, they're, and, they're, and it's all about bringing your offerings. There's a verse of scripture that comes to mind. Somebody gets Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah 7. Amen. Jeremiah 7. I want to read a verse from there. Jeremiah chapter 7. Right quick, I want to read a verse from Jeremiah 7. Verse number 10. I believe it is. Hallelujah. Jeremiah no. 7, verse number 4. You see, when the people, see, back, even back in the day, people turned from the worship of God in the temple. They turned. Why does the Bible say, for the love of money is the root of all evil? Because in the temple, they turned from the worship of God, and the root of all their evil came from the love of money in the temple. Look what Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 4 says. Read it, sister. Trust ye not in lying words. Trust ye not in what kind of words? Lying Lord. words. Trust ye not in lying words. Saying. Saying. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The house of God. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The temple of the Lord are these. Are these. Stop trusting and believing in lies when people say, oh, this is the house of God. This is the temple of God, and all they want to do is raise money. <laughs> Bible says, for the love of it is the root of all evil. All the root of the evil in the temple came from the Pharisees and the scribes, changing the temple worship from the worship of God to the worship of money. We see it today. And turn from these lies. Whereby the people says, the temple of God, the temple of God. That's why they want you to keep coming, because they want you thinking that their building is the temple of God. But God said, I don't dwell in buildings made with man's hands. Yeah. See, see, in the new covenant, he dwells in, his, in the hearts of his people. God wants to live in your heart, not in your building. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen? We about to finish. Turn with me to Luke 16, and then we're going to close there. Luke 16, verse 9 to 15. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which some were covered after. Covetous means they were greedy for money. People are greedy for money because they want to please the flesh.
flesh and glorify the flesh rather than God. Look what God says here. When Jesus, a lot of people like you say this. Oh, money is not evil. It's the love of it is evil. Did you know Jesus said it was unrighteous? Look what the word says. Luke chapter 16, I'm going to read so we can speed up. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, come out money, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Make friends with your money. If you got a lot of it, use it to make friends. You can make some good friends if you got a lot of money. Huh? Because all you got to do is just share. Be a giver, right? Man, people with money can be, they can have a lot of friends. And Jesus said, make friends with it. Don't glorify your flesh with it. Make friends with your unrighteous mammon. That when that it may receive you into where? Everlasting habitation. When you, when you leave this earth, God is going to look what you at what you've done. See, the greatest test of your faith is with your money. Listen as we read the word. Verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust the least is unjust also in much. In other words, if we, if the least is money. And that which is much is the knowledge and the understanding of God. Wisdom. Right? Look what the word said. If you're faithful with it, then you can be faithful with the wisdom of God. But if you're unfaithful when you got money, all you want to do is just glorify your flesh. Huh? Don't want to do nothing to help nobody. Listen to me, y'all. Verse 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. The unrighteous mammon means your unrighteous money. Why is he calling money unrighteous? Because the people who are printing it is the wickedness in high places. You never hear about the Federal Reserve, do you? <laughs> the people that are printing your money. All you hear about is Trump, Trump, Trump. Don't you know the power that controls Trump are the people who printed the money? They're controlling all the people in Hollywood. They're controlling all the people in your television. Come on, listen to me. And if therefore you have not been faithful to unrighteous men who will commit to you the, the trust of the true riches. The true riches is the knowledge and the understanding of God. Listen to me, verse 12. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, why is he calling it money another man's? Remember what Jesus said to the, to, to the uh, scribes and the Pharisees when they came, they came and said, should we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Jesus said, show me a coin. Whose inscription on the coin? Caesar's. Right? You give to Caesar's that which belongs to Caesar, but give God that which belongs to him. God wants your heart. God don't want your money. He wants your heart. Amen. He wants you to use your money wisely. And if you got a whole lot more than what you need, be a blessing to somebody else. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then love your neighbor. Oh, come on, y'all hear me. As you do who? Come on now. If you got a lot of money, you ought to be sharing with somebody that needs your help. Come on. Amen. 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 Listen, listen, listen. We're going to finish up here. No servant, verse 12, can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and love the, and hate the other. He will despise one and hold to the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, money. Now, I want you to hear verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were what? Covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. The Pharisees, now, you remember that word covetous? For the love of money is the root of all evil for which some were covered up. The, the ones who were covered was the Pharisees. That's why they were very rich. That's why the people, the, the people in the temple, they, they followed them. And the Pharisees were teaching the people that, hey, this is the blessings of God. And they despised and hated the poor. The temple worship got to the point to where they didn't want the poor there. Hmm. This is why Jesus came. He said, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, not to the rich, but to who? The poor. Come on, the poor in spirit. It was the poor that needed a savior. Right? Look, okay, listen to him. They were covetous. And he said unto them, you are they which justify yourselves before what? Men. You see, that's what money does. It makes you look good before other people. Right? When you got a lot of money, you look good before other people. That's why they love putting people with a lot of money on your television. 
Because we love sin. I want to be like that. Not you. A lot of them are miserable. But God knows what your heart for that which is highly esteemed among men is what? An abomination unto God. That which is highly esteemed among men. What is highly esteemed among men? Money, right? Hold on, turn off. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Men love money, don't they? And they will make people of God think if you ain't got none, God ain't with you. <laughs> They'll make you think God ain't with you. I want to tell this story, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna be done. I don't remember where it's at in scripture. I think it's in Matthew 28, when Jesus went to the cross to be crucified. Jesus went to the cross to be crucified. He had already told the people that in three days he will rise again. Didn't he say? Amen. Somebody didn't believe it, and then some said the disciples. His disciples, they're going to come to steal the body and lie and say he rose from the dead. So they put some Roman soldiers at the tomb. Am I right? Amen. They put the Roman soldiers there to guard the tomb to make sure nobody come and stole the body. And then say that Jesus rose from the dead. The Roman soldiers at the temple, they heard the earthquake. Are y'all listening? They heard the earthquake. Then the tomb rolled back and they saw Jesus. The Roman soldiers were the first to see him rise from the dead. They saw him. And the Bible says they were startled. They were look, looking with amazement. And they were speechless and they couldn't even move. Oh, listen at that. Imagine that. The Roman soldiers seen the earthquake and the tomb rolled back and they watched Jesus walk out of the tomb. Then they went to the Roman governors and they said, hey, this man that said he was rising from the dead, he rose from the dead. We saw it. Oh, glory to God, with our eyes. The Roman soldiers went and told the Roman governors this. Guess what the Roman governors said? Don't you tell nobody else this. If somebody asks you anything, you tell them the disciples stole the body. Y'all were sleeping and the disciples came and stole the body. And the Bible says they were paid lots of money to hold to this lie. And the scripture goes on to say, until this, until this day, they were told that the disciples stole the body. And the Roman emperor paid them lots of money to lie. Money, money, money. That's what's happening today. A lot of people are paid a lot of money to lie to you. I was listening to this brother, T.D. Jakes. I was listening to him, and he said something that shocked me. On national TV, this man said, faith and doubt, they go together. Faith and doubt goes together. And I said, my goodness, faith, doubt is the opposite of faith. A double mind is uns man is unstable in all his ways. You know why he said faith and doubt goes together? Because he wanted, he knows that his preaching of prosperity and, and all this stuff that God gives you what you want, he knows that people ain't getting what all that all that they, they're not living like he's living. Right? He knows that. So he tells them it's all right to doubt. And it's not all right to doubt God. God didn't promise you to, to give you everything that you want. He said, I'm going to supply all your needs. That's what he should have been telling the people. You see, the reason why he told them you can doubt, because he don't have to doubt. He's rich. Mm -hmm. Right? When we love money, we fall into a trap and a snare. And many are hurt and foolish less. And then verse 11, it says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. Fight the good fight of faith. Because nothing we have in this world, we're going to leave here with it. Mm -hmm. Let me
Amen? Amen. Stay strong in faith. And don't you turn from God. If you ain't got no money, don't worry about it. If God wants you to have some, he'll bless you with some. Come on, amen? He promised to take care of us. There's a scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. It says, what some things you have that will be content for your heavenly father? Said, I'll never leave you. Hallelujah. I'm not going to forsake you just because you ain't got no money. He, that doesn't mean he ain't left you. I'm with you always. Even to the end of the world. God bless and may God continue to keep you and shine upon your life. And may God be glorified in us as we live daily. God bless. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all your blessings. Yes, yes, Lord. 